guys. Well, welcome again. Like I said, my name is Jessica Likewise. I'm a BCBA and I'm hosting this event for you today. We're going to go over six experimental design practice questions. Um, the reason I have my camera off, uh, like I said, I'm saying this for the recording and for those of you who just jumped in, is because you will get this as a permanent product and it also will be posted on YouTube. And I wanna make sure that everybody can see the questions as opposed to seeing our videos over the questions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over six experimental design questions. I'm going to read the questions and I'm going to read the answers for you. That way, if you're studying and you're multitasking, like I did when I was studying for my exam, you can use this to study, like I said, even if you're doing the dishes and you wanna watch this in a replay mode, it'll be on YouTube, you can, you can do that. Um, if you're watching it live, I'm gonna give you a chance to answer the questions. And I just ask that you throw them into the chat directly to me to avoid reactivity and giving away all of your correct answers. And then if you're watching this on YouTube, you will just have to pause if you want a space to answer the question because I will jump right into it. That way we can minimize the time it takes for this video. So let's look at our first question. So it says, which of the following are in the control of the experimenter and help to maintain the integrity of a study? A, confounding variables, B, extraneous variables, C, independent variables, and D, dependent variables. So I'll give everybody a minute to answer. Again, just put your answers directly to me in the chat. Okay, guys, I think everyone has a chance, had a chance to answer this here. This is going to really have two parts to it, right? So it's asking what is in the control of the experimenter and what also helps to maintain the integrity of a study. So we're looking for something that does both of those things. Your answer here is going to be B, extraneous variables. Extraneous variables are things in the environment that you can control. You're, it, you have the ability to control them and you do it to make sure that there is nothing impacting internal validity. There's nothing impacting whether or not the independent variable really did cause that change in the dependent variable. So these are gonna be things like the time of day that you're doing the study, you know, what therapist that you're gonna be using, you're gonna be talking about maybe what the um, temperature of the room is gonna be, the lighting in the room, assuming that everything is working properly. You're gonna be accounting for anything in the environment that may actually impact the study. So those are your key words there, that extraneous variables, they maintain the integrity of a study. Sometimes we look at extraneous variables as a bad thing, but they're actually a good thing because they're things we can control to make sure that, they, that we're actually getting good results with our study. Excuse me, there are studies showing what we wanted to show. So I will go over what all the other things are because you're here to learn, right? So if that's okay with you in the chat, just say yes. So we're gonna go over confounding variables. Confounding variables are things that are impacting internal validity or things that are impacting our study that we can't control. Confounding variables are not a good thing, where extraneous variables can be a good thing. So confounding variables are going to be, there's different types of them. You have subject confounding variables, you have setting confounding variables, intervention confounding variables, and measurement confounding variables. And these are gonna be all things in our environment that we can't control that would impact our study. So an example of a subject confounding variable would be maturation, right? So maybe our study shows that a child had a ton of progress, but in reality, they had just um, matured throughout the study. I'll give you another example of a subject confound would be if someone is having, maybe someone got into a really big fight right before the, um, the, the intervention. And so they kind of came into it in a, in a bad mood, so to speak, that's not really ABA terms, right? But whatever happened to that subject right before the intervention, that could be a subject confound. A setting confound would be if there's something in our environment we can't control. Like let's say that the thermostat's broken and it's really cold in the room when you get there and there's nothing you can do about it. That would be a setting confound. A measurement confound would be some sort of a measurement a data, right? An error in the data. That would be something that would certainly affect our internal validity of the study. And then we have our intervention confound. This would be maybe one therapist is just a better therapist or a child has a really great relationship with one therapist, but not with another therapist. 
Those are going to be your intervention confounds. So all of these things can have an effect on our study and they can really like, minimize our internal validity of a study. So those are not good things. Our independent variables, those are going to be our interventions, right? And there may be more than one. Those are going to be your interventions. So if you're testing to see whether or not functional communication training decreases loping behavior, your independent variable is going to be your functional communication training, the intervention that you're testing. The dependent variable is the behavior. So in the following example, if you're looking at functional communication training and whether or not it has an effect on eloping, eloping is your dependent variable. All right, so any questions about this before we move on? Okay, then let's look at our question two. All right, Lori is a BCBA who is conducting an experiment to determine how long a child's break should be when using functional communication to training to decrease maladaptive behavior maintained by social negative reinforcement. What type of experiment should she conduct? A, a comparative analysis. B, a non-parametric analysis. C, a parametric analysis. And D, a component analysis. So I'll give you guys a minute to answer in the chat. Okay, guys, and we'll go over this. And just a reminder to send the messages directly to me just so we can avoid giving away answers and confusing people. So the answer here is going to be a parametric analysis. So a parametric analysis is when you have doses, right, of an intervention. So a non-parametric analysis is when you're turning things on and off. So if you were either giving breaks or not giving breaks, then it would be a non-parametric analysis. That's your on and off. But a parametric analysis is when you determine what level of the intervention is best. So does, is a two minute, if you're comparing two minute breaks, five minute breaks and 10 minute breaks, you may find that two minute breaks are not effective enough, but 10 minute breaks aren't necessary because they work just as, well. five minute breaks work just as well. So that is gonna be your parametric analysis. So you're gonna think about your non-parametric analysis as on and off, like a light switch and your parametric analysis is going to be like a thermostat. Yeah, and people are saying there's a lot of big words in this question. There are, and it's because sometimes they're not always straightforward on your exam. Um, I will go over a comparative analysis and a component analysis. A lot of times people don't realize what these are. A comparative analysis is when you're comparing two interventions. And this is not gonna be combining them or whether or not they're effective together. You're just gonna see what's more effective. Is NCR more effective or is functional communication training more effective? That is your comparative analysis. You're comparing two or more interventions. Your component analysis is going to be a little bit different. First of all, there's two types. There's an add-in component analysis and there's a dropout component analysis. And that's either you're going to be adding in interventions one at a time or dropping them out one at a time. Um, and then essentially with a component analysis, you're trying to see what components of an intervention are most effective. And sometimes you find that they're effective together. And so here, let's say you have an intervention where you're using functional communication training and you're doing NCR and you're using a token economy. What you may find is that if you use functional communication training by itself, it doesn't work. But if you use functional communication training with a token board, it does work. And then you may find that when you add an NCR, it still works, but it doesn't work any better. So therefore you wouldn't need to do NCR. So the big difference between a component analysis and a, and a comparative analysis is with the component analysis, you're seeing what parts of an intervention when there's more than one part of an intervention are working well together and what parts are not necessary. Whereas the comparative analysis, you're just comparing straight up two interventions against each other. So does that make sense to everyone? And I know I'm summarizing a lot of information in a really short period of time, which is why this will be posted so you can go through this again. I mean, I, you know, I do go over this in much more detail and, and my like intensive event, for example, I'll share about this weekend. Um, but I'm trying to give you as at least an overview of as much content as I can today. Good. And some people are saying they got, they actually just had a light bulb moment from that, which is awesome. All right, let's look at our next question. Our next question says, which of the following behaviors could you not target using an ABA as design? 
Again, keep in mind, this is a negation question. So learning multiplication, using language to request attention, on task behavior during circle time, throwing objects off the instruction table. So which one of these are and can you not use if you were using, or excuse me, not target if you're using an ABA design? All right, guys, I think everybody had a chance to answer this here. The answer here is going to be learning multiplication. And the reason is because it, an ABA design is a reversal design, right? You cannot reverse a learned skill. Once you teach someone how to do something, you can't unteach them how to do it. So let's say if we're using language to request attention, you could, in theory, stop reinforcing, excuse me, functional communication training, right? And then it would stop. Um, you on task behavior during circle time. Let's say you're using a uh, token board and you're giving them with a DRO, so you're using a DRO behavior, right? And then you pull that away and then they stop being on task. Throwing objects off the instruction table, whatever it is, maybe you're going to give them NCR and you stop giving them NCR. So, you know, you could turn thing, those behaviors on and off. But once you teach a skill, you cannot unteach the skill. So that's why your answer here is A, learning multiplication. All right, any questions on that one? I'm gonna do apologize about my dog in the background. He always makes his presence known during our meetings. All right, let's look at this one here. It says, this refers to the extent that people in a child's life are willing to carry out interventions. A, social significance, B, social validity, C, that should say internal validity, sorry for the spelling mistake there, and D, external validity. So answers please to me in the chat. All right, guys, so I'll go over this one now. So the answer here is gonna be social validity. That is just the definition of it. So it's just something to memorize. Social validity means that the people in a child's life are willing to carry out the interventions um, technically, social validity is not really part of experimental design, but I put it in there because oftentimes it's thrown against internal validity and external validity, so I just wanted you to see it in this context. Social validity, it means, so essentially, if I were to carry out interventions, but mom or dad were unwilling or unable to carry them out, if I were to write those interventions, then they're not valid, right? They don't have social validity because social validity says that the people in a child's life are willing to carry out the interventions. So social significance, that means that the interventions are important and relevant to a child's life, that they're going to actually have meaningful change for that child. So we wouldn't teach a child, for example, to touch their nose every time you held up a red index card. That would not be a socially significant behavior. Um, internal validity has to do with the extent to which the independent variable is having an effect on the dependent variable. Now, something you can have internal validity, but not be socially valid. So if I write an intervention that works really, really well in a clinical setting, but it requires a very skilled and trained therapist to carry it out. So I may be able to show internal validity if I can show that the independent variable is what's affecting the dependent variable. But if parents couldn't carry out the intervention because it's, it requires a, just a tremendous amount of skill from a trained and competent behavior therapist, then it would lack social validity, right? Because the parents wouldn't be able to use it. So internal validity is always going to be just that the independent variable is affecting the dependent variable. Then we have external validity. That is the extent to which skill um, the intervention can be generalized in another context. So that would be two types. So there are two types of external validity. There is systematic replication, which is when we change non-important things and get the same results. And then there's direct replication, which is when we directly replicate a study. In real life, it's almost impossible to directly replicate a study. So in real life in ABA, we're doing systematic replication where we're just changing minor things and we're reproducing the same results. Whereas in a laboratory, you could do systematic replication because things are much more controlled in a laboratory than they are in real life. But again, external validity has to do with generalization. Does that make sense? Because I saw some people in the chat were asking questions about why this was social validity. And again, sorry for the dog in the background. If you don't know who he is, his name is Lucky and he makes himself known on all my webinars and videos and coaching sessions and tutoring sessions. So you'll just hear him. Sometimes you'll see him if my camera's on, he jumps up and gives me a big kiss to say he's sorry when he's done making noise. 
All right, I don't see any more questions on this. So let's look at the next question. Okay, which of the following is not a variation of the multiple baseline design? A, subjects, B, settings, C, behaviors, and D, interventions. All right, guys, I think everyone had a chime to answer this. So the answer here is gonna be D, interventions. This is a negation question. So the traditionally, when we're using multiple baseline design, we're comparing subjects, settings, or behaviors. But multiple baseline design does have one intervention. So the answer here is D. All right, let's look at our last question, which is not true about external validity. So I did talk about external validity a little bit, so you will get a little hint here. A, group designs demonstrate stronger external validity. B, direct replication is a form of external validity. C, it is necessary for internal validity. And D, systematic replication is a form of external validity. All right, so put your answers in the chat. All right, guys, so here we did already say, right, that direct replication is a form of external validity. And we said that systematic replication is a form of external validity. So since we're looking for a negation question, those are definitely not our answers. So it leaves us with A and B. Group designs demonstrate stronger external validity and it is necessary for internal validity. Your answer here is C. You can have internal validity, but not have external validity. And I will talk about A real quick, and then I'll share an example of that in my career where that happened. So group designs, they do demonstrate stronger in external validity than, than single subject designs. Single subject designs, by contrast, they demonstrate stronger internal validity. Now I can do an entire half hour um, long in conversation as to why that's the case. And you really don't need to know why, but you do need to know that. So do memorize that for your test. That extra, you may need to know that for your test, I should say. But group designs, they do demonstrate external validity. And the reason being is because it, they account for, um, they account for a lot more variables and they show for subject generalization. They, they, they do a better job of generalization, right? Because there's so many people involved. Um, and internal validity, you can have internal validity, but not have external validity. And so I always share this story is many, many years ago when I was an RBT, but I was not an RBT. Well, this was before an RBT even existed, before iPads came out, when we used to walk around with the dinosaurs with our clipboards and our ticket counters and our rulers and graph paper and do all this stuff manually that you guys will never have the pleasure of knowing what that's like. I had a child I worked with um, and she had really, really liked negative attention, but she disliked positive attention. So social praise, we consider that a general conditioned reinforcer. Well, this person disliked social praise. Social praise was a punisher for her, but she really liked negative attention. So this person engaged in some very problematic behaviors. Um, they were, she was very destructive to things in the house and this, you know, I was working under a BCBA. This was many, many years ago. So whether or not ethically you should do this, we're not gonna discuss. Um, the time, like I said, I was working under a BCBA, but we had, this child was very destructive in the home. The family had a ton of money and this person was damaging their furniture. And so we determined that, or the, the BCBA determined that this person's behavior um, she was being reinforced by us reprimanding her. And therefore, the solution was going to be every time she engaged in the maladaptive target behavior of property destruction or aggression, we would praise her. We would clap for her and tell her she did a great job. We would give her a high five. And she had this huge extinction burst. And she was so upset. I mean, she would throw, she remember one time she threw the kitchen table down the stairs and broke it. And her dad clapped for her and told her that was great throwing, good job. Wow, I'm so impressed by how strong you are. What a good thrower. Then he would give her something else to throw. And believe it or not, after really 18 months of trying to get rid of this behavior, we had a massive extinction burst and it was extinguished within 48 hours. Never happened again. Um, that is a really bizarre situation. It's almost like some sounds like something you made up again, whether or not in 2022, that would ethically even be possible. I don't really know. I probably wouldn't do that as a BCBA now that I'm the BCBA, but 
you know, that there was no doubt. And this was written up. We had data to show there was beyond any shadow of a doubt, we had internal validity. The praising her, the giving her generalized condition, supposed supposed generalized condition to reinforcement for her negative behaviors or destructive behaviors, that definitely worked in getting rid of the um, behavior in which was the destructive behavior. However, that lacked all external validity. We would not do that again, and it would likely not generalize. So you can have internal validity without having external validity. So that's a really extreme example of that. And I think probably most of you won't encounter such an example like that in your career, but that is an example that I did encounter. So those are the last of my questions for today. You will get this, you'll get all six of those questions, you'll get the answer guide. I did wanna also tell you about my events that I'm doing this month. So many of you know, I do intensive events. That's when we spend an entire day going over one topic. Um, D is actually an eight hour long um, course that is just taking place this Saturday. It is an eight hour intensive look at experimental design. So if you're struggling with the experimental design, we will go into um, with tremendous detail, every aspect and more of, of obviously from what we went through today, that'll be an eight hour conversation. Um, you will get the replay of it. So you will get um, the replay for 21 days. So if you can't do all of it or you can only enjoy part of it or can't do any of it, you can still register. And then we have, and then also just so you know, if you do register tonight from this webinar, I will actually throw in. So every month I do this, this will be the third time I'm doing experimental design. And I have, I read a new mock for every single event. So if you do join tonight from this webinar, I will throw in the previous two mocks. So those are 40 questions each. So you'll get three mocks, three 40 question mocks. So 120 experimental design questions, plus the eight hour, um, the eight hour webinar, if you wanted to join that. Then I do have a task list G intensive coming up. That's gonna be on next Sunday and a taskless B intensive. This is the first time we're doing taskless B. G and B are both longer sections, so they are 10 hours. So those will be 10 hour workshops where we'll just go over everything that you could possibly want to know about all of these topics. So if you wanna check those out, you can get them on my website, hopeeducationservices.com, and you can use the code SAVE10. It'll take $10 off of each of those events. Mm -hmm.